Greetings, Resident Evil fanatics. It's getting dark out here. I hope you don't mind that certain someone in the distance. Something excites them tonight, an amusement they've never felt before. Welcome back to the Residents of Evil. I am here, and so is the big bad, Resident Evil Village. The object of our deep dives for so many months has arrived only to spark more colorful discussions and in-depth analyses. And here they come. Tonight, we will be examining the potential film and game inspirations of House Beneviento in great detail, including all available details from the full release of Resident Evil Village. So, if you haven't made it past this lovely place, save yourself from the massive spoilers that lie ahead. And this is the house worth saving if there ever was one. To survive this place, one must be daring and one must be hungry. House Beneviento remains perhaps the single most repulsive, gut-churning sequence in all of Ari Village, and for good reason. One might describe House Beneviento as Ari Village's boldest and hardest-hitting attempt at supernatural horror, as exists in games like Devotion and PT. But of course, here it is justified by biological means, similar to the mold in Ari 7. But beyond its paranormal aspects, it also entertains several iconic tropes from a very particular horror subgenre that emerged in the 60s and 70s. We'll also explore Donna's inner thoughts and motivations. Lots to discuss here tonight. I can only hope that our guest doesn't get too excited. Let us begin. Brace yourself, as this one's going to get sinister. What a chilling, yet strangely charming place this is. I'd just like to congratulate anyone that survived through this particular segment and celebrate this truly unrivaled experience with a bit of analysis. House Beneviento seems to borrow several popular tropes from the giallo horror film genre and adds its own flavor with the injection of what most would recognize as supernatural horror despite being biologically explained by the game files. Let's focus on the Jalo elements first. <gasps> While Jalo is often thought to defy any precise definition as a horror genre, it can be described as a loosely balanced fusion of whodunit mystery narratives hyper-stylized and fetishistic murder scenes, and lurid color palettes, often bleeding colors in excess. Jalo will occasionally, but not traditionally, include supernatural horror techniques. Miss Carol ha voluto metterti in guardia. Dai fantasmi, naturalmente, Mr. Jack. and a strange focus on seemingly arbitrary items of the killer, which may include dolls, marbles, and bits of yarn and wool. The victims are predominantly models and attractive young women, which is where the sexploitation elements often overshadow Jalo's reputation as a genre. The archetypal Jalo killer will never reveal their face until the final scenes of the film, and often operates as a vague, fully cloaked figure most popularly killing with knives, namely razors. Perhaps the most iconic killer outfit, as defined in films like Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace, and replicated by so many films thereafter, is a dark trench coat with thick boots, black gloves, a nude face mask, and a fedora hat. It's a very peculiar style that we've all seen before, in Mr. X, and how appropriate considering the stalking, door-busting, face-bashing propensities of these killers. 
considering this eerie similarity in his design and the very ostentatious camp aesthetic of so many Jalo films, it's almost undeniable that Capcom has injected Jalo elements into Resident Evil already. Just look at all these RPD and mansion set pieces of lavish knight's armor, generic Greco-Roman bus, stock paintings, and royal dining tables. Much like in Jalo films, this pretentious aesthetic hardly serves any logical purpose in the narrative, yet it somehow resonates with us in a lyrical or artistic sense. The very introduction of Resident Evil for so many of us was being stalked around the artsy-fartsy RPD by a masked killer ripped almost straight from these Jalo films, Mr. X. And now, decades later, in House Beneviento of RE Village, we have a strange amalgamation of some more niche giallo elements. Donna Beneviento is essentially that mysterious mask giallo killer of RE Village in a black morning garb, whose face in the flesh is only revealed in her final moments. It's very likely that the names Donna and Angie are references to the origin story of Annabelle, the 2014 supernatural horror film. Donna's appearance aligns quite closely with black-cloaked Gialli killers in films like La Bambola di Satana, and probably also takes inspiration from the hidden mother photos of the Victorian era. The game files on Donna describe how her kadu induced scar rendered her antisocial since childhood, but interestingly, she does not have the scar in this photo as an adult. It's very likely that she is using the flower's pollen to remove her scar from this photo through the eyes of Ethan, or it was simply painted to Donna's liking. Her feelings of isolation would only be worsened by her parents' death. Even after being adopted by Mother Miranda, she would continue to rely on her dolls for company, described by Miranda as hindered by her mental illness. This also fits the common archetype of the mentally unstable Jalo killer, often driven by some past trauma. House Beneviento makes multiple clever allusions to Dario Argento's Deep Red in particular. This film is lightly coated with a tinge of supernatural horror, producing an ambiguous terror from the killer's bizarre methods. The assailant plays a creepy child song when stalking his prey, which is tied to a strange tale in modern folklore. The House of the Screaming Child, the legend describes an abandoned old house in which a child is heard violently crying and screaming, yet the house has been completely empty and hermetically sealed for years. This strange concept is represented by a real house in the film, allegedly frequented by ghosts. Be careful, huh? What? There are ghosts in there. Ghosts? Everyone around here says there are. Very much like House Beneviento, its aesthetic is rather old and decrepit, with its paint peeling off of the old walls, its concrete chipping and flaking away, and those ghost rumors are entertained as well. The spiked perimeter fence, arched windows, and aged interior are also quite similar to that of House Beneviento, as the house's filming location was Villa Scott in Turin, Italy. Moving on to the more significant parallels between House Beneviento and Deep Red, I want to draw special attention to the scene where Amanda Rigetti, the writer of the House of the Screaming Child folktale, is murdered. For starters, the main room of House Beneviento greets you with a seemingly innocuous slice of Donna's home life. A motionless rocking chair with some knitting materials on the table, the yellow balls of yarn steal your attention, a single thread bleeding out of the basket and greeting Ethan as he enters the home. This yarn is an homage to the scene of Amanda's murder as she grasps one of her knitting needles from her ball of yarn, arming herself for the incoming threat. Considering how this film inspired John Carpenter's Halloween, it's understandable how the scene's yarn and knitting needles would re-emerge in Halloween as well, as Jalo films did heavily influence the slasher genre. It's fascinating to see a very similar iconography of the tranquil woman knitting at home, horror trope, here in House Beneviento, among the first of many attractions. Next, let's examine these hanging dolls that adorn the trees leading up to House Beneviento. The same scene of Amanda's murder in Deep Red showcases the killer's hanging doll. The same hanging doll is seen in the promotional material for Deep Red, usually armed with a scarlet-stained knife, 
which is quite reminiscent of Angie's doll friends using their various blades to attack Ethan. It's also interesting to note that this doll is armed with a meat cleaver, the same type of knife that the real killer, Martha, uses in the final encounter of the film. This further entertains the idea that Donna Beneviento, much like Martha, is just acting directly through her dolls. By dividing her kadu among her dolls, they serve as living extensions of her desire to slaughter. Back to the film, a couple times before Amanda's death scene, the camera focuses on these baby dolls and yarn figurines in a scene with just the killer, and later on, the killer begins harnessing the dolls as agents of fear and distraction, much like Donna does. Donna lays out the yarn and suspended dolls in and around House Beneviento to freak out Ethan and attacks with them later on. The light abruptly flickers off in Amanda's home as well, much like it does for Ethan multiple times, which is another supernatural trope. Now let's talk about Angie. We should make a point to distinguish dolls from automatons, as dolls are present in several Jalo films, usually the ones that also entertain supernatural horror to some capacity, such as La Bambola di Satana and Deep Red. In these films, the dolls simply serve as a recurring motif of the killer, a distraction to the victims, or a complement to the film's atmosphere. The automaton, on the other hand, is very unique to Deep Red, used by the killer to petrify and torment their victims. Professor Giordani finds himself backed into the corner as he hears that awful track, followed by an eerie silence. Donna Beneviento uses her kadu powered automaton, Angie, for the same purpose of tormenting Ethan's psyche. Donna even releases Angie onto Ethan in a way that mimics the automaton lunging towards Giordani. And funnily enough, Ethan and Giordani both stab the approaching automaton with the only thing they can get their hands on, Ethan a pair of scissors, and Giordani a knife, disfiguring its face. But of course, it doesn't give up so easily. It's also fitting that the hero of many Giallo films, especially those by Dario Argento, is an American tourist that inadvertently witnesses one of the killer's outings. From then onwards, out of pure fascination, the hero rapidly becomes more and more personally invested in the case, often to an irrational or even comical degree. And that foreign outsider is Ethan Winters here, of course. Similar to how Ethan is essentially playing the part of Jonathan Harker as he encounters Alcina's daughters, who parallel the so-called Brides of Dracula, Ethan also coincidentally fits the bill for the American hero of a giallo horror film as he searches for clues on his wife and daughter in House Beneviento. And, dare I say, he is examining Mia's plasticky mannequin and the gory photo of her corpse as if imitating the giallo theme of investigating the ghastly murders of beautiful young women. And notice this distinct painting of a pregnant lady on the wall. This mimics the Dario Argento tactic of illustrating the ongoing case with one central painting. Though Resident Evil is obviously full of paintings and picture puzzles, this is the only one outside of Ethan's home that specifically alludes to Mia and her baby. In Deep Red, the hero Marcus discovers a dark painting of a child holding a knife and his mutilated father in The House of the Screaming Child that plays a critical role in the murder case. Much like this painting represents Ethan's incessant worry over his wife and child this is where the supernatural aspect of House Beneviento reaches new heights. Through the hallucinations caused by the pollen of these flowers, 
Donna's house becomes a living manifestation of torture that feasts on Ethan's diminishing sanity. And speaking of the house of the screaming child, Rose's violent, haunting screams permeate the basement as soon as Ethan leaves the dismembered mannequin of Mia. And that screaming child is brought to life as a nightmarish fetus entity that groans and drawls, pursuing Ethan. Let's explore some of these bizarre supernatural horror techniques that are likely inspired by other renowned horror games. There are so many recognizable supernatural elements at play here, many of which we've seen incorporated already in other modern horror titles. P.T. probably served as the single largest source of inspiration for the entire basement segment of House Beneviento. The flickering lights, the long, lonely corridors, the dreadful vermilion lighting, the ticking clock, and even the fake visions are all very reminiscent of the stellar environmental horror of P.T. The radio is another similar feature, serving as your sole source of comfort in the awfully quiet corridors. That is, before it too begins to twist and mutate. The similarities are even more apparent when you realize this is the sole portion of the game that strips Ethan of all weapons. It's the single slice of the Resident Evil Village pie that has Ethan shrinking back on his haunches, panting so audibly, and pleading for mercy. It's the one segment that targets Ethan's damaged mental state and aims to decimate it even further by conjuring up evils so unimaginable and so absurd, yet so precisely tailored to Ethan's trauma, namely to his own daughter, Rose. And this brings us to that wailing child, yet another shared element in both House Beneviento and P.T. Let's unpack why Donna conjured up this truly unforgettable creature. Donna divided her kadu among her dolls, with Angie being the most vocal embodiment of Donna's real thoughts. When Ethan faces off against Angie, nearly all of Angie's lines are an outpour of resentful jealousy towards Rose. Everything would be better if Rose wasn't born. You do this to Rose too? Keep in mind that these are Donna's thoughts speaking through Angie, and Donna is Miranda's adopted daughter. In the words of Heisenberg, the heads of the four houses are nothing but experiments, test subjects to Mother Miranda. Considering her intense envy for Rose being chosen by Miranda over herself, Donna ultimately holds that same malice towards Ethan and Rose as all the other house heads, and that malice would amount to something truly vile and sickening. Perhaps this, through the mind of Donna, is the physical manifestation of that putrid, undesirable, undeserving infant chosen by Miranda over herself. If Ethan wanted his child back so badly, Donna would give her to him, as her own spiteful reimagining of Rose. Only Donna could do such a dastardly thing. Only she could summon such otherworldly abominations as we've seen, as this file recalls a man, presumably Donna's servant, seeing his deceased wife after inhaling the flower's pollen. Much like in RE7, the writers wouldn't dare introduce something so overtly ghost-like and paranormal without justifying it scientifically. This is commendable, of course, but after these impressive takes on paranormal, psychological horror introduced by RE7's Evelyn and RE Village's Donna Beneviento, it only begs the question, just how badly, if at all, are they wanting to include more supernatural horror elements into Resident Evil? House Beneviento will inevitably stand out as the single most memorable experience of the game to the vast majority of players. We can only wonder what Capcom plans to do in its next installment to revive this particular breed of horror. Until then, let's celebrate one of the most utterly disturbing yet strangely alluring horror segments ever introduced in a Resident Evil title.
So, do you believe some giallo horror elements influence Mr. X and House Beneviento? How would you feel about seeing more supernatural inspired elements in Resident Evil? Let us know what you think in the comments, and let us know what type of lore content you'd like to see in the future. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this in-depth analysis video, feel free to check out my personal channel. The link is in the description. Feel free to check out our House Dimitrescu analysis and other house analyses as well. More Resident Evil and Village content will be coming to Residents of Evil sometime soon. Until then, subscribe or that screaming child will come for you, wailing to be fed.